Good morning, everyone. This is Jim Chastain, Easy Power Support Engineer. Welcome to the Tuesday Morning Refresher. Uh, you're welcome to contribute by submitting questions and uh, comments anytime during the presentation or certainly at the tail end when you see what we've covered. Today's topic was specifically requested a couple weeks ago. And at the time, uh, I didn't understand, as I was kind of posting the topic, I didn't understand the specific request was for ArcFlash Relay specifically. So as I kind of looked over the way we've covered this topic in the past, I realized it's usually the, uh, the arc flash and differential relays that we give a short shrift to. So we're going to do it in reverse order this time. So welcome everyone to the presentation. And as we like to do, we'd like to start off with the poll question. And we appreciate your participation. So uh, here's where we're going first. Um, Basically, when you're doing coordination, what type of devices give you the most problem? And if you would help us with some feedback, it'll help direct some of the conversation as we go through this. And uh, I very much utilize this type of feedback, both for understanding how well we get the subject covered, but also to anticipate where we need to cover additional topics in the future. So we'll give this about five more seconds. Appreciate everyone's feedback. And here's where we saw the report. And then the second question is a little bit more general purpose. And that is specifically regarding time current characteristic curves. How well are you up on the topic? And uh, do you think it's something that you'd appreciate some additional information on? And as we get more into this, you'll see uh, the reason for asking the question. And not to belabor the point, but there's uh, always a need to understand the tools that we use in coordination because there's a lot of information delivered. So, and again, I appreciate everyone's appreciate everyone's feedback here. So. Here's how the audience reported on that topic. Good. All right. Again, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, let's kind of get into our discussion. So what I, I plan to cover today, uh, we're going to start off, as I kind of indicated, in a, kind of a reverse order. And we're going to talk more about the fixed time devices which I categorize as the differential relays and the arc flash relays. And then as we move into more of the uh, time-dependent trip devices, we will talk more about the TCC displays and, uh, and how, that, how that plays into the topic of coordination. So for the most part, we're talking about setting up the tools. And we may have to, depending on how long that takes, we may have to carry most of the discussion about coordination into a, a second feature, a second session. So the relays that, that I can uh, consider to be fixed time are, are defined as such, or I categorize them as such, because once the trigger event occurs, um, the breaker or the switching device is opened at a specific time delay, which is a function of the... Uh, the circuit element, the device that we're utilizing for the trip settings, independent of how long the, uh, the trigger event has lasted. And so in terms of an arc flash uh, sensor, an arc flash sensing relay, once that trigger has happened, once the, the arc has been determined or de detected, then there is a fixed time delay before the uh, breaker opens. And that is something that can be adjusted, but it's more a function of the hookup or daisy chain or intentional delays that are set into the device. It has nothing to do with how long the, uh, the fault itself lasted uh, to initiate the trigger. 
and likewise with differential devices. And so easy power permits, and when you think about this, a short circuit study is not a, uh, t has no relevance to time in terms of what, are, what the impedance calculations and what the current calculations provide. And so that's where we're going to dovetail into the discussion about uh, time current characteristic curves because that is the common denominator that allows us to look at time when it comes to tripping devices and fault currents. And so before we get there, in talking about um, a time fixed time device, we have to use some other way to set it up. And so Easy Power permits this setup in the database edit when we're looking at the arc flash tab of a bus data dialog box. And so I'm going to go through this, as I say, kind of slow because in the past I think we've kind of covered it too quickly. And uh, along the way, we will be able to talk about uh, and compare it to over current sensing device setup. So let's go ahead and jump into Easy Power and uh, show how, we, how we're going to cover this. So here we have a uh, kind of a typical switchgear arrangement where we have several phase overcurrent sensors, relays, one on the, the main uh, delivery or the main input from the utility, and then one each on three of the, ba the main feeders going out of the switchgear. And so each of these devices has settings that determine the... Uh, phase over current trip point, and then how long uh, time delay, how long that fault needs to be in existence before the device will trip. And this is all set up, if I open up this uh, dialog box, it's set up based upon the fact that we have a specific uh, relay from the manufacturer. In our settings, we're indicating this is a single function. And in our arrangement, we're showing how it's tied to a specific breaker to trip. And that breaker may or may not have an operation time that we want to incorporate in our, our time delay. And then when we go to the settings tab, we then characterize the dial settings for that specific function. And these are the, the values that we record as we do data collection on the, uh, the trip device. Now, uh, because these, well, let's just kind of go in and look at the specifics. If I go into short circuit and fault, my, fault all my buses, you can see that I have essentially some fairly high incident energy at each of the buses. And so there's a, a need if, if these buses require someone to work on them while they're being, while they are energized, there's some need for uh, some other device or some other method of bringing down these ener energies, uh, especially if we have an arcing situation. And so one of the more popular elements that allows us to do that is a device called the differential relay. And this, while these have been in the market for a fair number of years, uh, they're not necessarily well understood. But what it amounts to is that if we have, if we sum all of the currents going out of the bus and compare it to the current going into the bus, uh, as, as long as things are under control, we're defining that as a, uh, a safe condition or a normal condition. It's when there's some leakage path, and that could be a phase-to-phase -phase short anywhere within this zone of protection is when we want the differential relay to activate. Now, what's nice about this is that although we only show this connected across uh, the switch gear itself, this could incorporate uh, several layers of uh, voltage distribution, including transformers and other uh, sub switch gears, as long as we're summing the total current going out of the, uh, the whole system and comparing it to whatever the current coming in is. And so, in effect, we're nulling out the normal current, or the we're comparing the input and the output and nulling it out, 
And if there's a differential between them, that's when we want this relay to activate. Now, when we go to set this up, if we look at the way Easy Power requires this, we effectively set it up on a similar basis where we've got the manufacturer's ID, the function, and the relay that it's going to be connected to. And let's say this is still a, say, a two-cycle delay for the relay or the breaker. When we go into settings, we see that this has specific dial settings. And the significance here is this can be set up based upon the CTs that we're using uh, to a very relatively low level of current. And the response time is fixed based upon the operation time of the relay. Now, again, this doesn't uh, tell us anything about how long that fault may last. It's just that once that level is reached, the relay is activated. So again, it's a time-dependent, or it's an independent uh, time element, and it's not something we can accommodate in a, in a flat device, if you will, like a short circuit study. So the way Easy Power allows us to model this is we look at the bus that's, that's most affected by the tripping unit. So it will be this upstream device, and consequently the, the uh, bus is directly downstream from the element that's going to be actuating. If we open up that bus, again we've defined it as a piece of switch gear. It's all been set up as far as its rating. And when we go into um, well when we go into the arc flash tab, and again each one of these elements, each element in the system has a data dialog box. And so when we refer to a dialog box for a relay, then we're talking about its dialog box. In this case, we're talking about the dialog box for the main switch gear. And it has a number of tabs across the center. In this case, we're talking about our flash. And what we want to do in the case of a differential relay is override the global settings. That's what each of these uh, tabs on the individual elements allow us to do, is that normally we refer to the global settings for for an application to an arc flash event. In this case, we want to override the fixed the TC time calculations and say we also want to have user defined calculations included. And in this case, we're going to we're going to refer to the differential relay. And we, this is called upstream device, but in fact, we're, we're talking about the tripping device. And the relay function is, uh, I think it was an 87B. Now, the time that's put in here now is, is based upon the manufacturer's uh, allowable settings or whatever adjustments are set up for the trip of the breaker once the fault device has been, fault the condition has been determined. So, and, and these can be relatively fast. Uh, so let's say in this case, it's going to be 0 0.083. Now, because, because the, the tool doesn't know specifically, even though we're sensing the downstream elements, it doesn't know anything beyond the fact that there's a difference between the input and the output of the zone of protection. So at that point, we know there's something wrong between these two sets of CTs. So we can't go any further as far as opening up breakers downstream of this particular device. But now what this allows us is the ability when we go into the short circuit focus, and let's fault this bus specifically, and we look at our arc flash, we see that normally if you have a phase over current, then that trip time has been set and the incident energy was what we demonstrate or show at 34.9 uh, calories. On the other hand, if the differential relay is the tripping device, and we see here that the trip time is going to be the 83 milliseconds that we input, and so our incident energy will be uh, 4.4 calories. 
So the way we we demonstrate that is we go back and uh, isolate. We go back to database edit. I'm going to deactivate this particular relay. Go back to short circuit. Fault this bus. And now we can see our, our four calorie uh, energy near. So the question becomes, uh, what do we label this device? Clearly, uh, because somebody may be working in the area needs to know the full extent of the hazard involved. So the, the suggestion would be to uh, put the total incident energy level on the label. Then this particular energy would be utilized in the uh, arc flash work permit that would be utilized, part of which the procedure would say uh, when we're working on this uh, bus and we have the ability to detect a differential uh, arc, well, I, I guess I take that back. By, by utilizing this setup, we actually could label this bus because this is the arc flash protection for that bus at all times, as long as there's no way to disable the, the relay. Okay, so uh, hopefully I didn't muddy that up too much. And um, the same theme, if you will, is something that's handled on an ongoing basis. And... Uh, it comes up in a similar way with the arc flash relay. Okay, so this is this is the way a differential relay is set up in EC Power. Next, we're going to do the arc flash relay. So let me kind of open up that example. Now this is a little different in that the uh, relay involved. While it's it's sensing the uh, the light on each of the buses that it's going to be uh, covering, there really does not need to be an electrical connection, other than to the trip unit that that we're connected to. Now, in some cases, and we have had presentations by the uh, ABB folks, in some cases there is a sensing for. CTs to make sure that there's a certain minimum level of current in the switch gear before the arc light sensing is uh, activated. But for purposes of setup, setup I'm going to kind of ignore that. What I want to do is come up with some way to indicate that we are utilizing an arc flash relay and how we've got the set points, uh, if you will, daisy chained or hooked up. And so to do that, I'm going to come out to my equipment palette here. I'm going to draw a line and uh, kind of give some sort of a description to the way we've wired or daisy chained the sensors. So I've, I've drawn a line. I'm going to make it special color and a special style so it stands out. And then uh, in, my, in this case, I'm just going to do things linearly here and take it all around the block. But the idea is to give a uh, description of how of how the sensors are set up, as much for my my crew as for a reminder to myself when things are are being tested down the road. And the idea is that. While this is not an electrical device, it is a safety device, and uh, and the better we understand how it's been implemented, the better we can utilize it in our in our workflow. All right, so I've got my indicators here. So what I want to do, again, this is something beyond the one-line diagram specifics, is I want to input a, a picture, and what I've got here is a an image of a lightning bolt that I've kind of drawn up. And I'm going to put a, one of these at each one of my sensors. So I've, in my uh, orientation here, as I set my system up, 
I put a light sensor uh, at each one of these buses and what my legend is going to describe is the ability to uh, take each one of these or at least activate any one of these uh, four sensors in terms of activating the relay. Okay, so that's how I'm essentially setting it up. And in essence, this CT, uh, CT is not really uh, in the system if I don't have a minimum current detection. So I put in arc flash detect as, as just a indication of what this whole uh, contraption is trying to convey. Now, I, as far as time setup or, or protection setup, I do it the same thing as I did in the differential. So I'm going to open up my main switch gear. Again, uh, in my arc flash hazard tab. Now here, uh, because I don't have any other uh, phase over current devices, I'm just going to use user defined time. And I want it to convey that the device that's tripping is my arc flash sensed uh, relay and the time here is uh, again fixed by the delay time of the signal and how many modules I have to daisy chain and or any intentional delay that I'm putting in for whatever other reason. So in this case I'm using uh, which is kind of high let's go ahead and use 15 milliseconds the advantage of a, an arc flash detection system is it can be very fast. Uh, the one downstream, again, the tool has the sensor has the ability to determine uh, individual buses, and uh, let's go ahead and make it 12 milliseconds. I guess I need to stay within the rules. Now, again, these numbers are not ar arbitrary by any means. They are a function of how I've connected this up and how my control system's reacting to the specific signal. So I'm, uh, I need to be more specific when I'm looking at the system, uh, what's going to actually take place. I guess I may have flubbed up one of those settings. Yeah. All right, again, these are very fast. And when I go into my short circuit focus now, and I fault my buses, we can see that a system that has relatively high current um, has very quick reaction time to an arc flash event and, um, and consequently relatively safe settings for workers that have to be in the area. All right, um, I think you got the idea for how to set up these fixed time uh, devices. So let me just kind of cover one more example and we'll touch on the settings and more so on the, uh, the utilization of TCC curves. So I want to open up. Now, same kind of a thing where we have, um, in this case, a, a, a device that could be a differential detector or a multi-function relay. But in each of these elements, when we go into the coordination focus, we can look at, if we pick out an individual protective device, its plot or its performance on a TCC curve. Uh, the significance with the TCC curve is that we're displaying current on the horizontal axis and time on the vertical axis, and it's at a log-log scale. So the only difference between that and what we're used to in a, a typical Cartesian coordinate is the fact that we can get a whole lot more span of values. In this, this case, we're going from uh, a tenth of a second 
to a thousand seconds all on one graph and um, consequently we can we can expand or track the performance of a specific device over a wide range of current and time. The tool shows me, if I look down here at the bottom of the screen, shows me the coordinates of wherever I have the mouse cursor. And if I come up to the performance curve on this fuse and I put the cursor there, I can see that I'm displaying a point that represents 53.1 uh, amps and 44.2 seconds which means if I have a current at this point for that long, there's a potential that the fuse will engage and clear. And as I look at the thickness of this fuse curve, it represents the, um, if you will, the uncertainty factor or the range of values that could occur at any particular, within any particular fuse. So the, the left-hand side of the curve is the minimum time that the fuse can clear in. The right-hand side of the curve is the expected time the manufacturer pretty much guarantees the fuse will work. So if we look at this particular current of 100 amps and we take it up to the point where it intersects, let's try this again, where it intersects the curve, the manufacturer data sheet says that this fuse will blow or clear the fault of uh, 100 amps in 2.76 seconds. So now the tool, the, the benefit of the tool is if I can plot uh, the motors or the transformers that this fuse is protecting, uh, as long as the, the operation of the motor is going to be on the left hand side, then that means the fuse won't interfere with the total operation of the motor. If the motor is exposed to current that's going to be on the right-hand side, and let's kind of do this. Let me find an example here where we're showing exactly that. So here I have a motor and a fuse. So what I want to do is plot both of them on the same curve. The thin blue line is showing me a normal starting current and time for the motor as uh, suggested by the manufacturer. And as long as the, uh, the current doesn't exceed or, or fall to the right side of this motor starting curve, then we consider that a normal, a normal start or normal operation. Consequently, I would not want my fuse to interfere with any current that fell within this this envelope to the left. This short stubby curve here that's, that looks like a thermometer tilted to the left, this is the thermal damage curve and these are all part of the motor setup. If I double click on the curve, I can actually bring up the temporary data dialog for the, the motor itself and these are the factors that um, allow us to plot this curve based upon the full load current of the motor. If I uncheck the, the thermal limit curve and apply it, you'll see my little stubby curve uh, falls off. And so what this amounts to is that normal operations is to the left of the thin blue line, but if I have any current, if the motor gets exposed to any current to the right of this short stubby curve, it could potentially suffer thermal damage. So that's the function that the manufacturer wants us to pay attention to. So that means if this fuse, uh, fuse contactor, is going to protect the motor, it needs to be to the right-hand side of the thin blue line and to the left-hand side of the thermal damage curve. And that's what we've been able to accomplish with the way this, is, this, uh, this fused contactor has been set up. Now, same thing goes here. If I open up the setup dialog, temporary setup dialog, for this case we call it a fused uh, switch, we can see that the manufacturer's uh, type and style determines what this curve is going to be. If we pick a different size curve, you can see that it's going to apply. And so the lower part of this uh, curve is the fuse. The upper part is the overload, motor overload. And if we pick a different size, it will 
plot differently when it comes to the curve. Likewise, if we were to pick on the motor overload section of the setup dialog, if we pick a different value for the overload characteristics, then it will plot differently. Um, and that's in part how we determine what the uh, whether or not the protection for the motor starting operation is adequate. All right. Um, clearly, we're going to run way long on time, so I'm going to cut this short and pick up the dialogue uh, at a later date. But the bottom line is that the time current characteristic curves allow us to plot on a single uh, display the devices that need to be protected and the protective devices and their operations. And the advantage of uh, Easy Power's coordination module is that we can do this uh, across voltages, different voltages, and across different elements. For instance, if we were to plot this, this motor, these relays, and these breakers, we can see that all of those curves show up. And as we expand this a little bit, again, we recognize the thin blue line is the motor starting curve. The more uh, complex line is the relay that's a multi-lin. Uh, and if we double click on it, which will actually be R13 uh, in line with the motor, if we double click on it, and you can see that it very nicely covers, protects the motor from any spikes beyond a normal start and still does not uh, allow anything to approach the thermal limit curve. And again, this, is, this performance curve is a function of how we set up, the, set the settings on, um, and in the case of, of collecting data, how we recorded the dial settings, both for the overload and the time delays for this particular relay. Um, and, and that's why it's important when we're doing data collection to make sure we record each one of these elements because they, they may have a different format based upon the way the manufacturer presents the information. They could be physical dials. They could be digital settings. They could be um, switches, uh, dip switches that we need to read or verify what the settings are. And each of these settings will affect where the plot or the performance of that curve. Um, and so we'll pick that up at a future date. The point being now, and when we get to the point of of coordination, each of these curves, and if we look at this relay is the next one upstream, each of these relays has a potential for interfering with the other based upon what those dial settings are. For instance, if we look at R5 and we hover over the, the curve, the tool presents what those dial settings currently are if we left click and drag, we can, we can show what the performance would be uh, as those dials are changed. So if we, for whatever reason, were to decide to set this time dial, you can see at the bottom of this box, if we were to set the time dial at 1.3, we would have conflict between the operations or the protective settings of R13 and this area of miscoordination uh, could actually interfere with the uh, protection scheme that we would want for the plant. So we will spend more time in the future. In fact, we have a couple of pre-recorded dialogues specifically on coordination talking about how to uh, determine what the, uh, what the coordination requirements are between different elements on a given chain and then as we go farther up the system, how to coordinate uh, downstream devices with the upstream device. Now, one of the things that was, was shown, and we'll, we'll cover this more in detail, is there, there's more flexibility when we're talking about microcontroller relays and microcontroller-based 
trip units for low voltage power circuit breakers as compared to molded case and therein lies a need for a little bit more understanding of what we're showing when we see a display like this. So I think we've covered as much as we can in 30 minutes. Um, let me say that we have a, a number of tutorials online. You're welcome to uh, even review some of the older uh, videos we have posted that uh, spend a lot more time talking about the specifics of device coordination. Uh, welcome you to join in and even in this case uh, submit questions or suggestions for future topics. And uh, every other Thursday we have more in-depth technical discussions of both hardware and uh, power systems engineering topics. Anyone with uh, who owns the tools and has specific questions about how to utilize the tools in any of these areas, you're more than welcome to contact techsupport at easypower.com either by phone or by email and we'll be happy to help you out.